Well, we're in Esther chapter 6 tonight. So if you have your Bibles, turn there. And I gave Steve the Bible, uh, the Bible references, so uh, he'll have that for us. Here's a question. Does God always know what he's doing? Of course he does. I want us to learn something from this sixth chapter tonight. I think this little sixth chapter of Esther teaches us this principle. You and I need to learn a little thing about a big God, especially when it seems like everything's going just the opposite of the direction that we would want or anticipate it to go. Now, as we read through the scriptures, or as, as I read through the scriptures, I want you to keep a sharp eye out for the timing of the events as they unfold and realize something. Most of the things, 99% of the time, are not mere coincidence. They're God's appointed moments. God's appointed moments. We must remember that God's timetable is quite different from our timetable. You know. So verse 1 starts out this way. Steve will put it on the, on the screen for us, or Tyler will put it on the screen for us. And here's what it says. That night, that night, the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record, that would be the historical record, of his reign. Evidently, somebody kept a, like Betty, somebody kept a, a, a legitimate, a careful record of all the events that took place in, in the reign of the king. It says, that night the king could not sleep, so he ordered the book of the Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought in and read to him. Now, I thought about that little phrase this week. That night. So I asked myself, well, what night? Well, in the history of the setting, it was the night that the king couldn't go to sleep. Now, I want you to think with me. I jotted this down in my notes. Don't you find it interesting that on the very night Haman was getting ready to kill Mordecai, building the gallows, the king couldn't get to sleep. And he wanted the history book read of the events that had happened in his life. Now here's a thought. Sometimes God's miracles aren't so much in what it is that he does, but rather when he does them. God's miracles. They're not so much in exactly what he does, but when he does them. I mean... You can't dismiss the parting of the Red Sea by Moses as an oddity caused by some kind of earthquake or a windstorm. But aren't you a little curious that just as Moses' feet hit the water, what happened to the water? It parted. right when God wanted it. Now, here's another thought. Doctors write off people being cured by cancer as sort of a fluke of nature. But isn't it amazing that many times it happens after their church has spent the whole night praying for that particular individual? 
A lot of people have tried to explain the miracles found in the Bible by natural means. But they haven't even come close to explaining the timing of those miracles. Now, how God parted the Red Sea, I don't know. We shouldn't limit God. If he wanted to cause an earthquake, he could have done it. If he wanted to cause a windstorm, he could have. It doesn't matter how he did it. The point is that he did it, you see. Now, here's a fact that we need to know about God. When no one seems to notice what is happening, guess what? God does. I think God's got a better perspective being up there in the heavens to see, and sometimes we're sort of limited in our, in our perspective. But verse 1 tells us that the king couldn't sleep. Now, we're really not told why he couldn't sleep. I've mentioned sometimes to Ruthie, well, I didn't get a very good night's sleep last night. She said, well, maybe you took too long of a nap the day before in the afternoon. Well, that's probably true to some extent, you know. But verse 1 tells us the king couldn't sleep. The bottom line is when God doesn't want you to sleep, guess what? You're not going to sleep. So he orders the king, or orders the servants, the king does, to go to the royal library and get the book of the Chronicles. Okay, let's read on. Verse 2. Let's see what happens as, as, the, as the books are brought in. It was found recorded there that Mordecai had exposed a couple of the king's officers. I'm not going to try to say their names who were responsible for guarding the king's doorway, okay? And he had exposed these guys who were plotting to assassinate the king, okay? So it goes on to say in the, in the, uh, in the next verse <clears throat> that the king asked the question, what honor and what recognition has Mordecai received for this? That's what the king asked. You know, he had done a, a wonderful deed. Was he ever rewarded for what he did? Well, the book evidently said this. Nothing has been done for him. Nothing has been done for him. Now, Think about this. This was the very night that Haman, we found in chapter 5, was having the gallows built to do away with Mordecai the next morning. And the king couldn't sleep, and they read the event in which Mordecai had done a wonderful, wonderful deed for the king, and he hadn't been honored yet. Coincidence? Let me ask you this question. Can God direct us in the little things of life? Think about it. I think most of us would say yes. God can direct in the books that people pick up and the books that people read. Now, I have a, a man that I enjoyed reading. I enjoy reading. His name is Chuck Swindell. And he had church in, in California for years, and then he moved to the big state of Texas. And he wrote about different Bible characters, and he wrote a book on Esther. And he, he made this statement. I'll, I, I copied it. It says, Momentums, momenti momentous events often hang on the tiniest trivialities. It's humbling to think about the tiny glitches and twists that happen in my life, Chuck said, to direct where I am today. And I'm sure you've had those things happen to you. For instance, maybe it was by a chance that you got invited to go to church one Sunday. 
And as a result of you going to church by that invitation, your life was changed, right? What if you had decided not to go? Would your life have taken a different turn, you see? Think about how God has worked in your life up to this point. Using the most trivial little events and twists in your life to direct and to guide you where you are. In fact, I wrote this down. For me, it's crazy how God does those things. I can't control it. I don't even want to attempt to. But that's how God works the best. That's why it's so important, I think, for us to be obedient to him when he gives us direction. So, let me say this. I believe God was the one that orchestrated the king's insomnia on that very specific night. We're going to see why in just a minute. God's the one who directed him to read the part of the book that describes what Mordecai had done for the king. Here's the thought. When no one notices what you do, you can mark it down. God does. God notices every little thing that we do. In fact, there's a Bible verse. Tyler put it on the screen for us. Psalm 56 and verse number 8 says this. Hmm? Oh, okay, you wanted to quote it. Okay. Record my lament. List my tears on your scroll. Are they not in your record? I think this verse of Scripture, this little psalm is telling us that God keeps a list, a record, of all of our sorrows. In fact, he even puts those sorrows in a bottle. He has recorded each one of them in a book. In that bottle, according to that verse, is every tear you've ever cried. I believe, I believe that the psalmist is telling us that he keeps count of them. And I ask myself, and so often I think no one cares. God also has a book. And it's more detailed than anything the king had. And then in that book, he records every single work you've ever done. Whether anybody saw it or not, he did. Now, have you ever asked yourself, why does he keep a record? Well, because someday he's going to reward you for every act, every kindness, every good work that you've done in his name. Now I know you don't gain eternal life by your good works. That's what Jesus did. But once we give our lives to Christ, the Bible teaches that God says that we will receive a reward based on the good works that we have done as a result of our following the Lord's will. The Bible makes it very clear. Now think about this. If Mordecai had been honored five years earlier when he did this wonderful deed, could I be right in saying his life might not have been spared? My point is this. He was rewarded at the perfect time. The perfect time. God knew what he was doing. Somebody said this. You've heard it before. God's delays are not God's denials. Sometimes God just says, wait, right? And if we learn to wait, many times in our waiting, we're going to find out that the best is yet to come. Okay? 
When you understand why God allows things to happen in your life, you need to realize that He's not done yet. In fact, God is waiting for the right time. Okay, let's continue in our reading. Back to uh, Esther, verse number 4 and 5. When the, when the attendant said nothing had, had, had been done for Mordecai, the king said, I think this is really interesting. Who's in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the palace. He wanted to speak to the king so that he could get the king's permission, I'm paraphrasing, to be able to put Mordecai to death on the gallows in the morning. Okay? Keep reading. Next verse says, his attendants answered him when the king asked, who's in the court? Haman is standing in the court. I like what is said next. Why? Bring him on in. Okay? Bring him on in. The king put forth the order. Now, perhaps the king is thinking, what wonderful timing. My prime minister is just on time. I'm going to ask him what I should do for somebody who needs to be honored by the king. God's timing is perfect. Okay? Continue reading in the story. Verse 6. When Haman entered the king's, entered, the king asked, he asked this question. What should be done for the man the king delights to honor. Now, of course, Haman thinks he's talking about me, you know. I'm, I'm this one. After all, I'm second in command. I can just imagine whatever he had on that, that morning. He was just, you know, just strutting really big. Okay? So it goes on to say, he answered the king. For the man the king delights to honor, here's what you should do. Okay, he goes on. Have them bring a royal robe, one that the king has worn, and a horse that the king has ridden, one with a royal crest, and then place that on this one that you're going to honor on his head. Okay? Then... Let the robe and the horse be entrusted to the one, to one of the king's most noble princes. Now this is really, it couldn't get any better than this if you stop and you think about what Mordecai is, I mean what, es, what Haman is saying that he thinks the king should have done for him. Little did he know it was going to be done for Mordecai, okay? Okay? And have the King's best prince, lead him around. This is really going to get something, okay? Let them robe the man the king delights to honor and lead him on the horse through the city streets, proclaiming before the host, the host of people, this is what is done to the man the king delights to honor. Now, I wish I could have been there to have seen the faces of the characters. Because for me, this is one of the most satisfying and yet comical moments in the scriptures. Haman stood dumbfounded before the king. He probably couldn't believe what it was that the king was asking of him. I think he was saying it though he didn't say it audibly, he certainly was thinking it. Sir, you can't be serious, can you? Wanting me to tell you what to do for a person that needs to be honored? Well, the next little thing you need to know about our big God is when nothing seems just, it is. When nothing seems just, it is. I think so many times I speak for myself. I have a tendency to accuse 
God of being unjust. Why do those wicked seem to prosper? Why does that one seem to have everything work out so good for them? And then I thought about that this week, and I thought, you know, when I say those words, or I think those words, that's an insult to God. That's an insult to God. If you've been with us the past few, past, the past few weeks, you've been waiting for and wondering when Haman was going to get what he deserves. Well, here's just the first helping of it. Look at verse 11. Uh, Tyler put it on the street. After Haman had made all this, all of this injection to the king, so Haman gets the robe, and he got the horse, and he had to robe whom? Mordecai. And he led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, as Mordecai is being led, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Talk about an irony. For a whole day, Haman became the servant of Mordecai, commanding the people to bow down and commanding them to honor him. The very thing that Mordecai didn't want to do for Haman. That's why Haman was so upset. Haman had to tell others to do for Mordecai. Aren't you glad that God is not only fair, but that God is gracious as well? Think about that. There's two verses in the Bible that emphasize that, I think. The first one is Proverbs 21.30. Here's what it says. There is no wisdom... No insight, no plan that can succeed against God. Now that's quite a statement, folks, to stop and think about, especially in a day and age in which we're living. There's no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. And then the second one is just as important as the first one, and that's the one we had in our, our bulletins last week, Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 says this. If God be for us, who can be against us? So I ask myself, Jim, do you believe those verses? Well, I think even Haman's family believed those verses. Okay, let's continue in our reading, verse 12 and verse 13 of the Scriptures. Afterward, Mordecai, I returned to the king's gate. <laughs> but what does Haman do? He rushed home like a little puppy dog, you know, all disturbed, with his head covered in grief. And then it goes on to say in the next verse, and he told his wife and all of his friends everything that had happened to him. Now, this is when it really gets good. His advisors and his wife said to him, Since Mordecai, before whom you downfall, has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him, you will surely come to ruin. As crafty and as slick as Haman was, he couldn't outwit God. Now there's one little thing you need to know about our big God. And really, it's the theme of the book. When we think God is absent, He's always what? Present. When we think God is absent, 
He is always present. Even when you think God's left the building, God shows himself in an unmistakable way, proving that he is in charge. Proving and once again showing us from this story that he's running the show. The show. In fact, he's always on the job. Mordecai and Esther, I think they knew that. Haman never got it. So, here's a thought. If you want to win in the game of life, here's my advice. If you want to win in the game of life, and I think we all do, that's why we're here, then you need to get on the Lord's side. Otherwise, you're fighting a losing battle. But if God is for you, who can be against you? This reminds me of a story, maybe you've heard it before, of a man who was shipwrecked on an uninhabited island. The story says that he built a little hut for protection from the elements, where he could store a few items that he had salvaged from the wrecked ship. For several weeks he lived with only the hot sun and cold nights for company. Almost every day he scanned the horizon for the approach of a ship to rescue him. Nothing happened. Then one evening he was out gathering some supplies for the night. As he approached his hut, you can imagine what happened. The little hut was in flames. The closer he got, he realized the devastation of what had happened. He went to sleep that night near the breaking point. But early the next morning, he awoke to find a ship anchored off the island. The first ship that he had seen in all the weeks he'd been on the island. Still trying to believe his eyes, he heard footsteps and then the captain's voice. And guess what the captain said? We saw your smoke signal. And we came to rescue you. Everything that man owned had to be destroyed before he could be discovered and rescued. From that man's perspective, God seemed so distant for, for a long period of time. But in reality, I want you to know, God was working on both sides, was he not? He was working on bringing a rescue ship close enough to see the fire. And at the same time, he was reducing the sailor to nothing. That he would accept what it is that God was going to give him. So my point is this. God is always working. And we need to learn this truth. Things are not as they always seem to appear. So I ask myself, Jim, where are you in this story? Does God at times feel distant? Sometimes I think, where are you, God, when I cry out to him? And then I learn from this story in a passage of scripture like this. God definitely wants to lead. God definitely wants to guide our lives. But here's the key. He's not going to waste his effort until we're ready and desirous to submit to his lordship. You think that's true? I think that's very, very true. So I said, that's a good thing to do on a daily, on, on a dailiness. Submit 
to the Lordship of God. We never know what God has planned for any of us on any given day until those days unfold. Wouldn't you like to have been here in this story? I just can't imagine how God could have had it turn out any different. Now, I've stopped here because I was thought I would be a little bit further along and I didn't want to get into the next episode of the story. But as Mr. Johnson, who is my, one of my teachers in Bible college, used to say, and it's not good English, but it's good theology, it just gets gooder and gooder as you begin to see the story unfold. You know, Hollywood has a habit of sometimes getting us right to the edge of anticipating what's going to happen next in the story. And then they say, well, next week we'll pick up where we left off. So we'll come back next week and we'll see what happens to these gallows. Remember, the men had been working all night, mind you, on erecting these gallows that Haman had had decreed to be done. He was, after all, second in command for Mordecai to be hung on. And now here's Mordecai walking around town as the big shot and Haman leading the horse by its reins. Couldn't be any humbler, could it be, for Haman? Well, let's just wait and see what comes next. Father God, we thank you for the lessons that are contained in the Holy Scriptures. We thank you that your word is alive and that your word is fresh and that your word has answers to our questions and to our concerns. God, you are a great God. Help us to realize that you have a perfect plan and nothing happens to us apart from that that plan. God, today we have a number of folk on our prayer list, people that have asked us to pray for them on a regular basis. We ask God that you would reach down in only the way that you can do. You would intervene in the lives of each one of these. Some need a touch for healing. Some need a touch for contentment, peace. Whatever it is, God, we ask that it will be done according to your will. For we know that your will is always the right. Thanks for meeting with us another day here beside the road, this place that has been set aside as a place to gather and fellowship. We ask, Father, as we go our separate ways, that we'll be conscious of the fact that you're going to put somebody on our path this week that maybe needs some encouragement. Might we go out of our way to say a kind thing, realizing that kindness matters, especially to the one who seems to be beat up all the time. Give us safety as we travel back and forth. Be with those that are on vacation from our midst, those that are with family and friends, help them to have a wonderful time. For all these favors that you bestow upon us, we thank you in Jesus' name.